Hello, my name is Charlene Garcia Sims and I'm the Genealogy and Special Collections here at Rawlings and we have a real uh, big treat. We're going to be talking to the author of Trade on the Taos Mountain Trail. Deborah Martinez Martinez, PhD, is CEO of the publishing company Vanishing Horizons and writer of fiction and nonfiction of the Southwest. For 20 years, she recruited students in Colorado and New Mexico for Colorado State University at Pueblo, and for eight years, she recruited for the League of United Latin American Citizens, known as LULAC, Educational Service Center. She served as interim director of the Pueblo Hispanic Education Foundation, PHEF, sat on the board of PHEF and the board of Colorado Educational Services and Development Association for 10 years each. She was an historical interpreter at El Pueblo History Museum. Her area of frontier expertise is in dyes. Her book, illustrated by Robert W. Pacheco, Trade on the Taos Mountain Trail, was a finalist in the Colorado Book Awards. The book incorporates the Native American and European trails and trade goods. She is a founding member of the Fran Jalico Chavez chapter of GSHA. Her latest book is Chicana Activists of Colorado, Powerful Women, Paper Dolls, and Their Stories, available by calling 719-561-0993. So take it away, Deborah. Good morning. My name is Deborah Ana Martinez Martinez de Lucero, and I'm representing the wife of one of the traders that goes on the Camino Real. I have my pack basket that my Apache mother taught me how to make. And We're going to be going all the way down to middle of Mexico, and they're going to be bringing us from farther south in Mexico some of this. And this is called the golden grain. These are bugs. And we're going to sell them for lots and lots of money to St. Louis and New York for on the trade trail. The book that we're talking about today, I put together years ago when working at El Pueblo History Museum. And Trade on the Taos Mountain Trail talks about 1100 AD all the way up through 1840s. And that means we're talking about trade routes that were there before the Spanish. Spanish did not do everything, folks. The Native American trade trails were there first. And you can see the Native, if we go to the book right now, you'll be able to see the Native American trade trails. And if you laid a map on top of this, of the highways of the United States right now, you would see that they're basically the same. And these are the trade routes that the Spanish used as well. They used the Camino Real. Real up and down uh, to Mexico City. And they also use the trade trail that goes across to California. All of these trade trails mean that we had the people here had connections with the Cahokian Mounds over in uh, Missouri. They had trade trails that went up and down the coastal areas. Of course, it's a lot easier to send a canoe um, down a sea coast, large canoe down the sea coast, um, into Mexico or bring goods back through the Gulf of Mexico that way. So there were trade trails all over the place, and this is what people did. This is what people did with their families, with their children. Um, most of the time, you have to see representation of just men as traders. But the women were there. It's just that our um, contemporary uh, literacy swing does not include the women that were there. In the book, Trade on the Taos Mountain Trail, I did include many of the women. But there were trails between um, Mexico City up to Pueblo Bonita in Arizona, also Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. And these were known as they're thought to be, they were deserted by the time archaeology came into being, but they were thought to be uh, ceremonial centers because the items that they found were very ceremonial. Um, turquoise, for example, uh, from different, many different mines was brought to uh, Pueblo Bonita and Chaco Canyon. Also, in, from Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, also up that trade route came birds. Um, the particular one was macaw birds. Macaws were raised right across the American border in um, Casas um, Grandes. They were raised there because they didn't want to haul them from below Mexico City 
the jungles below Mexico City, all the way up to Chaco Canyon. They didn't want to haul them all that way. So what they would do is they would raise them in uh, Casas Grandes. They know that because they see the little shelters that were made for the birds and the bird bones that are still in there. So there's a lot of evidence that the, the birds were traded, both live birds and the feathers. The uh, Aztecs were master feather workers. Um, some of their work is in uh, the Vatican, some of it in Spain. Um, of course, Mexico still has some of their treasures in terms of the the feathered pieces, which is not a common practice or call not known now. Cahokian Mound people was a huge civilization. They didn't have large cities, 10,000 strong, were not that abundant in Europe. But when they came here, these cities were 10,000 strong. Um, in Tenochtitlan, they had running water in the palaces. They had um, bathrooms. They had, uh, and the people, the traders, who were the traders would go up and down, down into Peru um, with trade goods. They'd go up north into Alaska for trade goods. So trade goods came from all over. And we know this because of some of the excavations that have been done. Mesa Verde. Who were the Mesa Verde people? Who were the ancianos that lived in Mesa Verde? And some very, very strange objects. For example, there's a cup. And you move it, it would rattle. What is this? What is this cup that shakes? Well, in modern day, you'd say it's a, it's a cuppy for a child. And you shake it. and into the bottom of the cup is built several um, little pebbles so that when you shake the cup, it um, rattles. A wonderful object. That came out of Mesa Verde. Mesa Verde was, um, uh, Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon were actually stripped of many of their objects of art um, before the rules came into being around the 1900s. Um, people would come and from different countries, excavate and then take them, the goods back to their country, and we still don't have them back. So the trading business, for example, the trade rep woman that I represent, they would go visiting, trading, taking different objects from um, the eastern United States over to uh, Mexico City, down into the Barrancas. They would go trading, and their trade trails would last several days, several months in some cases, and they were often welcomed uh, into the territory. It was an opportunity to show humor, to show respect, to show um, uh, objects that were unknown in different parts of the different parts of the country. It was a win-win situation. Trading was, and trading was basically bartering. It was not, I'll give you this much money for it. The only money at the time was the Mexican Spanish coins called reales. And I do portray this item in the book. Um, the re My grandmother still called uh, money reales. And they're the coins that you have, might have heard about. Have you heard of what, uh, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar? Um, those were coins that they cut up. And um, so an item might be worth, when they started using money, as I said, they would basically barter. When they started using money, the traders would. These are the coins across the middle. And these coins are cut into bits. They're cut into one eighth pieces of the silver coinage. And it was the, the silver that uh, bailed out Missouri from one of their um, depressions. And this is in modern times. This, that was um, 1850s. Now, one of the things that they did trade, I mean, we, we can't ignore this. They traded women captives. Um, but the, the big part about women as captives is when they traded them, those women took with them languages, games, knowledge about 
um, yerbas and herbs for healing, uh, different ideas. So it was a way of across the frontier, tribe to tribe and people to people to look at different ideas, technology. What can you imagine is technology in, um, in those days where you can't, it would be as if you have a shoe. Say you have a crock that fell apart. Um, maybe your daddy fixed it with um, some Gorilla Glue. Whoa, great technology. Well, in those days, they used technology for a number of things, but they wouldn't be the technology that we think of today. It might be a glue, some type of a glue that they made from different things. It might be the um, different objects that they traded, uh, plants, uh, parts of animals. Uh, of course, I mentioned the macaws and the birds uh, that they traded. And we know that they kept um, aviaries there at Chaco Canyon because we can see them. We have the evidence that shows that it was an aviary that was at Chaco Canyon. Obsidian tools. Obsidian is uh, volcanic glass. Where does it come from? If you wanted a knife made of obsidian, where would it come from? Well, Washington had a lot of volcanoes. There's volcano volcanic fields up there that you can get large chunks of obsidian. And that's what was used for knives, cutting. Um, and that's technology. And others would come from deep in Mexico. The pottery tells another story about how people learn to make pottery that will not blow up. If you were to put some pottery exposed to a flame, it would shatter, boom. So they had to learn how to make it so they could have a cooking vessel. Otherwise, how did they learn how to cook? Um, these are some of the pottery pieces um, from 1100 AD forward from different places um, up and down. We, so we know that they were traded because we find pieces of these different pots that have different, um, for example, mica is one of the things, it's a, it's a rock that you, pound and then you put the mica, uh, pounded mica like powder into the pottery pot with the clay. You mix it in with your clay and then you build your pot. And when it's exposed to heat, it will not shatter. So these are the kinds of things. This is how we know what happened with trade that was up and down the east and west, north and south. This is an incised shell. That means it's a shell that someone cut into the surface of the shell. Well, how do you cut into the surface of a shell without breaking it? It's technology. Again, it's technology, wonderful things to know. Um, an acid, they created an acid from different plants and then used the acid very carefully to draw on this shell and then they have the picture. And I'm not sure you can see it, but it's, it's a man dressed as an eagle with his arms outspread. There was things like salt. There's places that you would go get salt. Where do you get salt in Colorado? Where do you go to get salt? If you were a Native American living in Colorado, where would you go to get salt? Not Salt Creek, but <laughs> up on the North Platte, they have some places that have salt um, that you can go dry the salt and bring it. They had copper ornaments because in some places in the country, copper will come to the surface in chunks so that you can work it. And they generally used copper for making a necklace, uh, for ornaments, ear bobs, things like that, because copper is too soft to use as a knife to cut, um, say cut the skin of an animal. There were pearls in all of our rivers up and down the United States. And the people would get the pearls, uh, use them for bracelets, use them for, again, ear bobs, necklaces, um, and trade them. Pipestone. Pipestone to, it's what you think, to make a pipe. You, you carve out the bowl where the fire is going to be, and then you put a wooden stem on that. So they traded those things. Those things are from the east of the United States. 
from the Southwest. Uh, can you imagine different things that they would trade? The ones I've written down is, you know, grizzly bears used to be uh, from our north border to our south border. Pinion nuts was a big trade item. In the Spanish days, they would fill up um, barrels. Barrels of pinion nuts would be something you would donate to um, the church. And they would take them down the Camino Real um, to donate for your taxes. Um, they would make baskets. Some of the, the greatest displays of baskets I've ever seen is 30 minutes north of us in Colorado Springs at the Colorado Fine Arts Center. Turquoise, as I said, turquoise was different from different places, and they did trade it. For example, uh, Cahokian Mounds didn't have turquoise, so they traded it from someplace around Arizona. Some of the Native Americans who lived around uh, Arizona would go across on their trade trails over to the Cahokian Mounds and trade with those people there. From the west, I mentioned they would travel up to Alaska, and of course ivory would be one of the things they would trade. Uh, again, obsidian from the west, from the volcanic fields of um, Oregon, Washington. Abalone shell, that's from Southern California. They would trade not only the shell, but also, I'm sure you've seen these shells. Uh, they have holes down the side. My grandparents had a large one, very large one that they kept in their uh, living room as kind of an oddity. But now I find out that abalone, the fish that grew inside of the shell, um, was traded from Southern California, again, all the way across to Cahokian Mounds. Um, so the dried abalone meat was very, very important. Um, they traded seal, walrus skin from the west, salmon that ran in the rivers. They'd dry it, smoke it, and it was ready for trade. Fish oil, they would collect it, preserve it, and it was, again, a trade item. So there was quite a bit that they would trade from north to west, east to south. Before the Spanish, there is... Um, in that photograph that you're looking at is an abalone shell. So that's one of the things they would trade. Uh, in that photograph, you also see the bugs that are traded. These bugs were so valuable. The amount that I have here on the tray this morning is about $30 worth. But it just takes a little bit to make a beautiful, beautiful red dye. Nothing else makes red. Some things make pink, but not red. Um, some of the work that the Native American did, uh, for example, with uh, quills, uh, porcupine quills, that was also a trade item. Toys, um, you probably know that in Mexico, they didn't have any wheeled vehicles to transport for trade. They did have to uh, wheels on the toys, though. But it was un they were unable to use it. They didn't have any large animals to pull them with. Uh, they would also trade, for example, it takes two deer, two full deer hides to make an Apache dress. Uh, so they traded a lot. They traded people who were... This wonderful photograph uh, shows you the people coming down from the... Um, I wish you could see it larger, but they're walking down from the Pueblo to trade on a plane down below their Pueblo. You see teepees raised. Many of the native tribes came together to do trading um, of different items. Um, the people who lived on the plains, the Comanches, Cheyenne, would trade buffalo. They hunted buffalo, so they traded buffalo robes. Buffalo robes were very, very valuable, and some in our museum collections are more than 100 years old. Um, so they valued them, they traded them. A rich person could trade enough items to um, get a buffalo robe. But they also traded, as I said, captives. Um, because more, the more wives you had, the more captives you had, they created more trade goods for you to go on the trade trail with. 
Um, it takes one woman um, several weeks to get a the hide of a buffalo prepared um, to be usable and to trade. Captives also bring new ideas that I mentioned. That's why the captive workforce was worth its weight in gold. They, they brought new ideas, new techniques, new medicines from different tribes, um, bring, um, they would bring hickory from the east to use as bows for bows and arrows because we don't grow hickory here in uh, this southern southwestern part of the United States. And having more wives and captives also gave people more time for alternative, um, to use alternative and learn alternative methods. Say, for example, you hunted a buffalo. What are you going to do with it? Well, there's the hide that I already talked about the hide. Uh, you would line your, your pack basket here with hide and uh, pack all your parts up. Of course, the meat was dried, and they traded that, and they traveled with uh, their, their bison jerky. But we never think about things like the tail. The tail was nice because it was a nice fan. What else did the buffalo use it for? To flap off flies. Uh, the horns. The two horns were valuable because they were able to put things inside of the horn and it doesn't come out of the horn. So that was valuable. Um, they saved the intestines and they made sausage from the intestines. The uh, uh, intestines, uh, the grass, they'd stuff it with vegetable matter, grasses, um, meats, different meats, fats, and then there you have it. You have intestines that become sausage the same way they do today uh, the stomach was used for different things the bladder of the buffalo was used as a container for water and of course the droppings of the buffalo the buffalo poop was wildly used because um you go on the prairie and the prairie doesn't have trees you can chop down to light your fire but you find little puddles of dried buffalo poop. So that's going to be a very, very good source of fire. Also, when you burn buffalo droppings, um, it chases the flies away. So th there was so much on a buffalo, and there were different kinds of buffalo also. There were the mountain buffalo. Did you know that? There were mountain buffalo um, closer to here in the Rocky Mountains. But down on the plains is, and that species died out. The larger mountain buffalo died out. But the plains, uh, the buffalo from the plains are still the buffalo that we have, thank God. Some things that changed, trade, trade items that changed lifestyle. For example, corn. Corn was um, developed in Mexico. Um, Different items that we think of as just being general, but peppers, tomatoes, chicle, gum, comes from Mexico. Um, the corn in Mexico and Peru, they have probably 11, 12 different kinds of corn. And um, they use them for different things. So with the corn, it meant you had a larger diet. They raised them with beans, they raise them with squash. So if you had a larger diet, your people grow taller and stronger. Horses, of course, changed lifestyles. And it didn't take long before the Native American found the ways that horses were going to change their lifestyle. You could go farther in terms of distance. You could go different places that you never would have been able to go to before. You could access different goods. You could haul more goods with your horse than you could just in your backpack. This is the Taos Mountain Trail. Taos Mountain Trail that we're talking about is the trail that goes over the backside of the west side of the Spanish Peaks, the Y Toyas. Use the Native American name, the Y Toyas. When they were talking about putting a railroad. Now, 
they didn't obviously put a railroad through because this trail is just a foot trail. Um, but I have talked to some uh, a botanist who found at the top of the Taos Mountain Trail a cairn, which is a pile of rock. And near the cairn, and the, it's just a, like a guidepost, pile of rock. But it's significant because near the pile of rock, in the rock, was um, seeds that were from Mexico City. So you, you could conclude, prematurely, but you could conclude that Native American people have used this trail, Taos Mountain Trail, um, for many, many generations, coming and even using that trail. Um, there is a trail called the Taos Trail, as opposed to the Taos Mountain Trail. And that trail runs through, uh, down past Trinidad, through Mora, New Mexico, and over to Taos. And it's, that is a wagon trail road. This Taos Mountain Trail was just a, a conduit to get from here in Pueblo, Colorado, to Taos, New Mexico, where, which was the nearest church, which is, was important to many of the people who lived here at El Pueblo Trading Post. This is the Camino Real Trail. Now, when the Spanish came from Mexico to come north, <clears throat> they came on the Camino Real Trail. Well, before it was a Spanish trail, it was a Native American trail. And um, the, you will, if you read the story of them coming north, they will say that their Indian guide told them to go this way, not this way. So we know that they had Indian guides that were showing them the way that they go, that the Native American who preceded the Spanish. We always make the Spanish stories always make it sound like the Spanish did it. They did not. They were working closely with their Native American brethren. After the uh, Native American era, well, it was totally Native Americans trading, I mean, up and down the continent, you come to the European and American trade time period. So they used mules. Um, Chihuahua is known for raising um, mules and breeding mules. Um, donkeys, burros, whatever you want to call them, but they were uh, known for trading them. Of course, with the Europeans came the large trade in uh, sheep. And if you were going to go on a long trip, hey, take a couple of sheep with you because they did not have refrigerators. So whenever we go down on the Camino Real, we take about 50 sheep with us. And that's just to feed us on the trail. And also we have people on the trail that hunt for meat as we go along. So we have the fresh meat from the sheep. We also have fresh meat from the um, the the deer and so forth that they get for us. We haul barrels of whiskey, we haul barrels of piñon that I mentioned. Uh, from the American traders, Native American traders were very thrilled to get uh, metal. Metal hatchets are so valuable and were traded from family to family, generation to generation. Now during this time period also, we're talking the 1830s, 1840s. Um, some of the traders were as young as um, 13, 14, 15, because you became a man when you were 12. Um, so there were some traders that were also um, slaves who came with masters into this area and were freed and became traders. And here you see a photograph. This is from my book. Of, uh, and this was the photographs were all taken during um, the Bent's Fort um, uh, event that they have once a year when they come together to trade. The Western trade routes that we know about, um, for example, the Goodnight Trail here in Pueblo, um, coming from Texas, um, and it was. They brought the cattle through that direction 
um, when the American traders came, they were selling. They were not trading. Um, came up here and they shipped it to the Kansas stockyards so that they could ship them east and west. So trade on the Taos Mountain Trail just tells you a piece of the trade story because um, it's focused, of course, here on Colorado, New Mexico, going down into our, our uh, Mexico. The, we like to say that the borders, uh, we did not cross the borders. Um, the borders crossed us. Um, I've tracked my family down to 1790 in New Mexico. Can't go quite farther back than that, but um, that's where my family's from. And uh, I was really, really pleased to be able to put together in the book the what I think is a true story. It always comes more true in different times and different places. But um, the story that I tell in this book is that it was very much a, a, a place where anybody could who wanted to work hard and make their, uh, their living trading, they could do that. This book, this book was also a, a finalist for the Colorado Book Awards uh, through the Colorado Humanities Office here in Colorado. So, and this was my first book, and it was the first book that received that award as a finalist. The second book of mine received the award, also with Robert Pacheco as illustrator, um, is Chicana Activists of Colorado. As I said, many, many times you have um, representation of men who were the traders. And yeah, yeah, they were the traders. But you don't see the women because traders would get a Native American wife and they would uh, go with that wife uh, down to wherever they were traveling because the wife had mm -hmm. a teepee and her children and would feed him, take care of him. and. Uh, a good model of this was uh, Charles Ottoby, who had the first farmland here around Pueblo. Charles Ottoby had his um, Hispanic wife, Spanish wife from New Mexico. He also had his Native American wife. And when he built his farm, he built a house for each of them. <laughs> and yeah. uh, his Native American wife traveled with him as he went trading up and down yeah. uh, areas. He was a farmer because one of his biggest trade items was vegetables. Yeah. We don't think about that. But if you have no way to preserve a vegetable, no way to grow a vegetable, yeah. it would be nice if somebody would come with some <laughs> dried calabacitas and be able to offer that to you to trade. Yeah. It would be wonderful. I mean, I, uh, this is really, oh gosh, so fascinating, Deborah. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and um, uh, you um, talk, you mentioned a lot of multicultural people in the book. Were there, there that this many variety of people that were on the trail? Well, you know, in the Western movies, they tend to show the West as being um, European Americans with. Uh, battling the Native Americans. And that's not a good representation of what the West was, or what the frontier was. The frontier was combinations of your Native American peoples, your Spanish peoples. Uh, peoples coming from Mexico were Spanish and Native American from Mexico. Um, the other European Americans who came after it was opened you realize that this part of the United States was not open to them until after 1821 and when the Mexicans won their war and um, they opened the Santa Fe Trail. Now the Santa Fe Trail was mapped and used a long time before the Eastern Americans came through that trail. That existed a long time before them, but they're the yeah. ones that made it. Yeah. Um, that's what's in our history books. You have to, if you remember nothing else from today, Charlene, the main thing is this. Don't believe what's in your history book. Don't even believe what your teachers tell you. Why? Because they're teaching you the easiest 
way to tell the story. <laughs> like the men were traitors, hmm. right? Yeah. So what? Uh, what? What do you want? Uh, what do you want people to learn from this book, especially children? Because it's, it's, it, it's such a wonderful book for you know for for children as well as adults. But what is it that you want uh, people to learn from this book? One of the things that you'll notice in the book that, um, and here's a, another picture. This is Jim Beckworth, who was black. His mom was a slave, and he came west. Jim Beckworth is as big a storyteller as Tom Tobin. He was wonderful. He had kids. He had Native American kids. Um, and in this book, it shows the photographs of your um, Native American children, your Spanish American children, um, uh, your African American children. It was a very diverse, what we call diverse. Yeah. And and sometimes uh, the history books just don't just don't uh, just don't show that. This is just amazing. Uh, let's tell people how they can get it when, once again. How they can purchase a copy of it? Yes, thank you, Charlene. Um, the book is published by my company, Vanishing Horizons, and the the website is vanishinghorizons.com. Horizons is plural. We have many horizons. Vanishinghorizons.com, and you can order a book through there. Um, they're also at here in Pueblo, like located at um, Golden M on B Street, um, El Pueblo History Museum, uh, uh, out in Fort Garland at the Fort Garland Cultural and, and Resource Center. Um, oh, yes. And there's uh, there's others uh, up and down the front range that also carry the books. Yeah. But the easiest way is just to order it. Yeah, and you can also check it out at our library right here. Yes. On there uh, actually, they're they're on second floor and um and and third floor, and uh, this is just so fascinating, uh, Deborah. Thank you so much for sharing all this information uh, and wi Charlene, with us. This book also because I made it in order to help the teachers who would bring children. To, because I was an interpreter at El Pueblo History Museum. Mm -hmm. So I designed, I made the book specifically for teachers to use. Mm -hmm. There's um, a grid in here about mileage and goods, value of goods. And it's a grid that um, a math teacher helped me to create and verify that these were the concepts that fourth and fifth graders were learning at yeah. the time. So teachers can yeah. pull up the information for these yeah. sheets. Um, yeah. It, they're like scavenger hunts through the different sections of the book. Yeah. And also the mathematics that goes along with it. Yeah. How many miles is it to Mexico City from here? How many miles from Santa Fe did they have to travel? So, so we, there's yeah. There's a lot of things built into the book for teachers, homeschool yeah. parents, or other uh, learning yeah. to be done using. So there you have it. Uh, you can uh, teach math, you can teach history, you can teach geography. And Deborah, thank you so much for sharing uh, sharing this with us today. Okay. And so for all of you uh, that are listening out there, please continue joining us for all this wonderful uh, virtual virtual programs. And uh, so uh, have a good evening. Thank you again. <laughs>